Is it? Who couldn't hear me? If you could not hear me before, please raise your hand. All right, I'll repeat. It's going to be boring as hell, but I'll repeat. Our society encourages people when they think about using software to consider it from a short-term superficial point of view. People are encouraged to ask, is it convenient, is it reliable, is it efficient, and not to ask, if I use this program, what will it do to my way of life? What will it do to my freedom? What will it do to my community? The free software movement is concerned with these deeper issues. A program is free software if it respects the user's freedom and respects the social solidarity of the user's community. Leaving so soon? I hope it wasn't something I said. Um, software which is not free, we call proprietary software. This software keeps users divided and helpless. Divided because they're forbidden to share it with others, and helpless because they don't get the source code so they can't change the program. They can't even verify what it's really doing. And often these programs have malicious features designed to spy on the user or restrict the user or even to attack the user. So, <clears throat> that's a very general statement to say you should have freedom. Even Bush used to say he was in favor of freedom. And Bush couldn't recognize a freedom even before he crushed it. So, I had better say something more specific. A program is free software if you, the user, have the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it, and thus make the program do what you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. So, if the program comes with all four of these freedoms, then it's free software because the social system of using and distributing the program is an ethical system, one that respects freedom and social solidarity. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program imposes an unjust social system on its users. And that's what it means to be proprietary software. So, the difference between free software and proprietary is not a technical difference. It's not a question of what the code says or how it works. The same code could be released as free software or as proprietary software, and sometimes it's released in both ways in parallel. So it's not a technical difference, it's a social difference. It's a matter of what kind of social system you have as a user, you have to be, participate in as a user of the program. So, to develop a free program is a contribution to society, more or less depending on the details, of course. To develop a proprietary program is not a contribution, it's an attack. A proprietary program is a trap 
set for users to separate them from their freedom. If the program has attractive features, those are the bait for the trap. They attract users to surrender their freedom and become users of this program. So it's better to develop nothing than develop a proprietary program. <clears throat> and thus, the goal of the free software movement is that all software be free so that all software users can be free. But what makes these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each freedom has a reason. Freedom two, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish. Merci is essential on fundamental moral grounds so that you can live an ethical life, an upright life as a good member of your community. If you use a program which denies you freedom too, then you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma. At any moment, whenever your friend says, this program is nice, could I have a copy? In that moment, you will have to choose between two evils. One evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to deny your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. Well, if you are in that dilemma, you should choose the lesser evil, which is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. But what makes this the lesser evil? Well, if it's inevitable to do wrong to somebody or other, it's better to do wrong to somebody who deserves it because he has acted wrong. We can assume that your friend is a good friend and a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. By contrast, the developer of the proprietary program has deliberately attacked the solidarity of your community, deliberately tried to separate you from your friends. So if, it's, if you're stuck with doing wrong to one or the other, do wrong to the developer. But being the lesser evil does not make it good. It's never good to make an agreement and break it not even in cases like this one, where the agreement is inherently evil and keeping it is worse than breaking it. Still, breaking it is not good. And if you give your friend a copy, what will he have? He will have an unauthorized copy of a non-free program. And that's a rather nasty thing almost as nasty as an authorized copy. So, when you have fully understood this dilemma, what should you really do? What you should really do is make sure you don't fall into the dilemma. I know of two ways to avoid it. One is, don't have any friends. That's the method implicitly suggested by the proprietary software de developers. The other method is don't use that program. Don't use software with, which fails to give you freedom number two. And that's my method of avoiding the dilemma. If someone offers me a program on the condition I refuse to share it with you, I say, my conscience does not allow me to accept such a condition. So get out of my office and take your nasty program with you. So I will not use software that forbids me to share it with you. And you shouldn't use it either. 
And we should also reject the propaganda terms that are used to demonize the practice of sharing with your neighbor. Terms like pirate when applied to the practice of sharing. The people who use that term want us to assume that helping your neighbor is the moral equivalent of attacking a ship. And morally speaking, nothing could be more false than that because attacking ships is very bad, but helping your neighbor is correct. So we shouldn't call it pirate. When people ask me what I think of piracy, I say attacking ships is very bad. And when they ask me what I think of software piracy or music piracy, I say from what I've read, pirates don't attack using software or by playing instruments very badly, but instead they use arms. So I don't think this is software piracy or music piracy. So I refuse to fall into the trap of accepting the words in the question as part of my response, because if I did that, I would be saying that sharing is piracy, and I don't want to say that. So this is the reason for freedom too, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish, essential on fundamental moral grounds. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential for a different reason, so you can control your computing. Now, there are proprietary programs whose licenses restrict even the use of authorized copies. And they can make all sorts of restrictions. I heard about one proprietary program, which is used for publication, uh, for publishing things, which says in its license that you can't use it to publish anything that criticizes the developer. There's almost no lengths they won't go to if they think they can get away with it. So obviously this is not having freedom in even in using the program. It's not control of your computing. So freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough because that only means you can either do or not do whatever the code of the program is set up to let you do. So the developer continues imposing his decisions on you, not through the license, but instead through the source code of the program. So in order to have control of your computing, you need freedom one, the freedom to study the source code and change it to make the program do what you wish. This way you decide instead of letting the developer decide for you. If you use a program without freedom one, you can't even tell what it's doing. And many of these programs have malicious features designed to spy on the user, restrict the user, even back doors to attack the user. And this is not just a problem in obscure programs from companies people have never heard of. One example of a program without Freedom One that has all three of these kinds of malicious features that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. People have found spy features in Windows that send reports about the user. And they have found, of course, we, we know perfectly well that it's designed with DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, to limit users' use of their own files in their own machines. And it has a back door with which Microsoft has the power to forcibly change software without asking permission of the supposed owner of the machine. Now, I say supposed because when Windows is running in the machine, Microsoft really owns that machine. <laughs> uh, 
And it doesn't just impose changes in Microsoft programs, it has been known to impose changes in other programs. Whatever program happens to be installed along with Windows, Microsoft can change it if it wants to. But Windows is not the only example of a product with these malicious features. Another one is an ebook reader called the Amazon Kindle, although I prefer to call it the Swindle, because it's designed to take away the traditional freedoms of readers of books. The freedom to do things such as lend a book to your friend, borrow a book from the library, <clears throat> sell the book to a used bookstore, buy the book anonymously by paying cash, which is the way I always buy them, and even the freedom to keep the book for as long as you wish and read it as many times as you wish and eventually pass it on to your children. All those freedoms they want to take away from us. They want to set up a pay-per-read universe. Now, the Kindle, Kindle means, of course, to start a fire. It's effectively designed to burn your books. Has, has all three of those kinds of malicious features. The only way to buy a book is to buy it from Amazon, and that requires you to identify yourself. The system has digital restrictions management, which is a feature to, features to restrict you in your use of your books. And <clears throat> it has a back door, which we found out about a few weeks ago, because Amazon used it to remotely erase all the copies of a particular book, namely 1984 by George Orwell. Have you, raise your hand if you have read that book. Then you know that in that book, one of the things that uh, Big Brothers men do is they rewrite and erase history. And what would they do it with in the computer age? Well, they would love to use a back door like this one. There was a lot of criticism. Amazon got a lot of bad press for doing this and promised it would never do it again. But I don't think that our freedom to keep our copies of our books should be up to the goodwill and, and uh, firmness of a company in defense, no matter what company it might be and no matter what they say. <clears throat> now, I won't claim that all of the programs that don't give you Freedom One have malicious features. I don't know that they all do. Maybe some of them do and some don't. But we can't tell which is which in general. We only occasionally find out about these malicious features. Before Amazon used the feature to remotely erase those books, we didn't know that they had such a power. Without the source code, there's no way to check what they can do. So we can only divide these programs into two categories. There are the ones in which we know of malicious features and the ones in which we don't know of any. Now, some of these programs have malicious features we don't know about. And others, I suppose, don't have malicious features. But we can't identify which ones have or don't have malicious features because we don't have the source code. But nonetheless, even though I can't identify which ones have malicious features and which don't, I can make a statement about all of them, and that is their developers are human, so they make mistakes. The code of those programs has bugs. And the user of a program without Freedom One is just as helpless facing an accidental error as facing an intentional malicious feature. 
If you use a program without Freedom 1, you are a prisoner of the code that you use. Now, we, the developers of free software, are human too. So we also make mistakes. And our code also has bugs. It's said that every non-trivial program has bugs. But if you find a bug in our code, or anything in our code you don't like, you are free to change it. Because we did not make you a prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. But, <clears throat> and thus, freedom one is essential, but it's not enough. Because that's the freedom to personally study and change the source code. That's not enough because, first of all, there are millions of people that use computers and don't know how to program. They don't know how to study and change the source code themselves. They're not capable of directly exercising this freedom. But second, even for programmers, which I assume many of you are, Freedom One is not enough because there's so much software in the world. In fact, there's so much free software already in the world that no one per person who uses computers is capable of studying and mastering the source code of all the programs she uses. It's just too much work for one person. So the only way we can fully have control of our computing is to do it working together, cooperating. And to do that, we need freedom three. The freedom to contribute to your community. The freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions, if you wish. This makes cooperation possible. Suppose a few people develop a free program and release it and we use it and we like it, but we wish it had certain changes and other features. Well, somebody can start with this program and implement a part of those features and release her modified version. And somebody else can start with that and implement some more and release his modified version. And some others can start with that and implement the rest and release their modified version. And then we'll all use it and we'll all thank them for collaborating to make these improvements. And so freedom three means that we only have to make the improvements once and then everybody can use them. And that includes the non-programmers too. Suppose that you're not a programmer but you have a business that uses computers. Most businesses are not in the software development field and they don't have the capability, but, they but most businesses use computers. So suppose you notice that the way the program works is inconvenient for your business and that certain changes would make things work better and the business would run more smoothly and it would make more money. Well, it would be worth it to you to pay a price for some programmer to implement these changes for you. If the price is right, of course. And that means free software gives you the opportunity to do this. Because free software implies a free market for all kinds of support and service. By contrast, support for a proprietary program is generally a monopoly because only the developer has the source code. So only the developer could make any change. If you're a user and you want to change, you have to beg and plead and pray, oh, almighty developer, please make this change for me. And maybe he will. There are developers that say, if you think you found a, a problem in this program, pay us and we'll listen. And if the user pays, the developer says, thank you so much. In six months, there will be an upgrade. Buy it and you'll see if we fixed your problem. And you'll see what new problems we have in store for you. 
But with free software, you can pay any programmer who's willing to do the job, and it's up to you who you want to do business with. So you get the benefits of a free market, which means that for those users that value good support and can afford to pay for it, they can expect to get better support for free software than they can for proprietary software. So you'll find the programmer you want to pay to make the change, and then you will give him a copy of the version you use, exercising your freedom number two to redistribute exact copies. You can do that even though you don't know how to program, or you can let the programmer come and copy it for you. Then he will study the source code of your version and change it, exercising his freedom number one. We're assuming you're not a programmer, so you don't know how to exercise freedom number one yourself, but he can exercise it for you. And then when it's working, he will give you a copy of his modified version, exercising his freedom number three. Once again, he's exercising his freedom for you. And then, assuming this version works and you use it, you pay him. And a, an important part of the free software business works this way. So, all the users get the benefit of the four freedoms. Every user can exercise freedoms number zero and two. The freedom to run the program as you wish, and the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish, because these don't require programming. Freedoms one and three entail programming. The freedom to study and change the source code, and then optionally distribute copies of your modified version to others, they involve programming. So any given user can exercise these freedoms more or less according to how much she knows how to program. But, and it's true that there are many people that don't know how and can't exercise these freedoms. But when others who are programmers exercise these freedoms and when they release their modified versions, all of us get to install them or not, as we wish. So we all get the benefits of living in a society where everyone has these four freedoms. <coughs> and these four freedoms together give us democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users. Every user can participate as much as he wishes in society's decision about the future of the program, which is simply the sum total of all the user's decisions of what to do with the program. By contrast, a proprietary program develops under the dictatorship of the user, of the, sorry, of the developer. The developer has total power and the users simply have to accept whatever he does. And the developer uses this power to bully the users, exploit them, and abuse them. So the non-free program is simply an instrument of this unjust power. That's part of the plan, part of the reason it got developed usually is somebody wants to have power over some users. And the program's purpose is simply to get him power. And once he has that power, he will be tempted to put in malicious features, trying to get even more power. That's what somebody greedy does when he has some power. He tries to use it to get more. Malicious features are quite common in proprietary software and rare in free software. The reason is, with free software, we have a defense against them, and that is, the users can read the source code, so they have 
a chance of finding the malicious feature and when they find out about a malicious feature in any fashion they can modify the program to get rid of it the users of the proprietary program can't do anything when they do find out about the malicious feature they still can't remove it but the users of the free program can remove it and that means that nobody has power to impose the malicious feature on everyone else with free software because everyone has freedom nobody has power over anybody else yes theoretically someone could put in a malicious feature but he can't look forward to a successful practice of imposing that on the users because certainly if he uses it they'll find out and they will dislike it and they'll take it out and the, whoever put it in will lose his reputation too so it's a prospect of probable failure whereas with proprietary software it's a tempting prospect of success so this is why developers put in malicious features more in proprietary software they think they'll really succeed in abusing people and no one will be able to stop them I should have thought of this 20 minutes ago <clears throat> so on one hand we have freedom social solidarity and democracy on the other we have the dictatorship of the developer society must choose free software and reject proprietary software so the ultimate aim of the free software movement is the liberation of cyberspace and everyone in it we invite you to escape from proprietary software and join us come to the free world and live with us in freedom the free world is the new continent that we have built in cyberspace to, as a place where it's possible to live in freedom there's no way to be free living in the old world of cyberspace where every program has its lord who bullies and abuses and exploits the users so the only way was to escape and first we had to build a place to escape to now because the free world is a virtual continent it has room for everyone and there are no immigration restrictions so please come and join us so how did we build the free world it was in 1983 that I decided to do this I wanted to use computers and have freedom but that was impossible because the computer won't do anything without an operating system and all the operating systems were proprietary so how could I change that I was not very famous except among the users of Emacs and I had no political experience or skill and very few people agreed with me so I didn't think that a political protest movement would get very far but I had I thought about it and I realized that as an operating system developer there was some something else I could do to eliminate this problem I only had to write another operating system and then being the author I could legally make it free and then everybody would be able to use his computer in freedom using my system so I had discovered a way to eliminate a social problem doing technical work in my own field which I was qualified to do now this meant I was aware of a social problem which most people didn't recognize as a problem I had the skills necessary to try to eliminate the problem and it looked like nobody would do it if not me that meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this work it was my duty 
it's as if you see somebody drowning and you know how to swim and there's no one else around and it's not Bush. then you have a moral duty to save that person. However, perhaps I've made a statement that's too strong. Perhaps one might dispute whether you would have a duty to save Sarkozy if you saw him drowning. So I guess I have to take that part of my statement back. Uh, but. I don't need to figure out those questions because I don't know how to swim. But in this case, the job that needed doing was not swimming, it was writing a lot of software. And that I knew how to do. So I decided to develop a free software operating system or die trying. Of old age, presumably. Because at the time, the free software movement, which I was starting, had no active enemies. Lots of people thought it was silly, but they just laughed for a moment and paid no more attention. So the obstacle was not opposition. It was a big pile of programs that we would need to have a complete free operating system. And at the beginning, I didn't know if we would ever finish this job, but I had to try. Because if I didn't do this, it was almost certain I would never have freedom. There was just no use not trying. There was no use giving up. So I decided to develop a complete free software operating system. I decided to recruit others to join in so we would finish it sooner. I decided to follow the design of Unix, which was a portable proprietary operating system, because I wanted to make this system portable too. I knew computer design would change in the coming 5, 10, or 20 years. So if the system wasn't portable, it would probably get obsolete. And then I decided to follow, to make it compatible with Unix, that is, having the same commands, so that the many users of Unix would find it easy to switch. And then I gave it the name GNU, which is a recursive acronym, meaning GNU's not Unix, G-N-U, which is a humorous way of giving credit to the program that I was making a compatible replacement for. In using that name, I followed the tradition of the free software community in which I participated in the 70s. That community was at some laboratories at MIT, but people elsewhere also participated sometimes. Sharing our software was our way of life. Whatever programs we had, we would share them. When we wrote programs, we would share them. We would get programs from others and improve them and pass them on. So in that community, I learned that free software was a good, wholesome, ethical way of life. Now, in the 70s, system programming was generally not portable. Every program was written for a particular kind of computer. So it was quite common that you would want to use a certain program, but you couldn't because you had a different kind of computer. And the only solution was to write another one, and you did. That was common in the whole computing field, but in our community we had this special tradition to give the program, the new program, a recursive acronym name which said that this program is not the other one. So, for instance, in 76, I developed the first Emacs text editor, an extensible programmable text editor. And after that, there were many imitations, and some were called this or that Emacs, which is an obvious name, but not very funny. But there was also fine for fine is not Emacs, and sign for sign is not Emacs, 
and Aina for Aina is not Emacs, and Mince for Mince is not complete Emacs. And version two of Aina was called Zwei for Zwei was Aina initially. And so you can have a lot of fun with recursive acronyms. Of course, I look for a recursive acronym for something is not unit, blank I N U. But nothing like that is a word in any language that I could speak. So if it doesn't have another meaning, it's not funny. So what could I do? I had the idea to make a contraction, to have some things not Unix, blank NU. And being an engineer, I systematically tried every initial. ANU, BNU, CNU, DNU, ENU, FNU, GNU. Well, GNU is the most humor-charged word in the English language. It's used in countless word plays because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced new. So every time you wanted to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U and you've got a joke. Now, perhaps not a very good joke, but there are lots of them. So given a specific meaningful reason to use this name as the name of a programming project, I couldn't resist. But when it's the name of our system, please do not pronounce it according to the dictionary. If you talk about the new system, you'll get people confused because we've been working on it for 25 years now and using it for 17 years. So it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU. And it will always be GNU despite the people who erroneously pronounce it as Linux. But how did that error get started? Well, during the 80s, our task was to develop all these programs, hundreds of programs we would need for a Unix-like system. And in 1990, we had either developed or found all the components except one. The component that was still missing was the kernel, which is the program that allocates the machine's resources to all the rest. So in 1990, the Free Software Foundation hired a programmer to write a GNU kernel. I chose the design. I chose an advanced design with a microkernel as the base and various modular servers as the top half. And the microkernel already existed. So, uh, so I thought, well, we'll only have to write the top half. That's only half the work. And since these programs are modular and we could bootstrap them using an existing environment, I thought this would all be much easier than writing a kernel from scratch. But there were various problems and it took many years even to have a test version and it still doesn't work very well. That's too bad. But it wasn't a disaster for the overall goal of developing a free Unix-like operating system because somebody else, Mr. Torvalds, developed a kernel. He used the usual monolithic design and in 1991, and he got it to work at a minimal level in less than a year. Now, this kernel was released under the name Linux and initially it was not a free, it was not free software because the license back then had a restriction against commercial distribution, which means that users that were businesses could not have freedom number two or freedom number three. So it didn't qualify as free software. However, in 1992, he changed the license and he re-released Linux under the GNU General Public License, which was one of the free software licenses in use at the time. It's the one that I had written to use it in most of the components we had developed for the GNU system. But why does a free program need a license anyway? What is a free software license? Well, According to today's copyright law, any 
work that is written, including a program, automatically has a copyright. And copyright law, by default, prohibits copying, distribution, modification, even in many countries, it prohibits running the program. So how can a program be free? Only if the copyright holders make a formal statement giving the users the four freedoms. And that statement is called a free software license. That it, whatever statement they make, giving permission is a license. And if it adequately provides the four freedoms, then it's a free software license. So there are many ways to write a free software license. The GNU GPL is just one of them. But the GNU GPL is used in around 70% of all free software projects. What I think has made it so widely used is it's a copyleft license. Now, what does that mean? Every free software license has to give you freedom number two and freedom number three, the freedom to distribute exact copies and modified versions. But there are various ways to do this. Some licenses are very permissive, and they even let people redistribute proprietary copies. So somebody can get a copy of a free program, and then he can redistribute under a different license, making the program proprietary. And he can make changes, and he can release the modified version as proprietary software. He might release only binaries and never let people have the source code. Or he might put on restrictive, unjust conditions. When I started developing GNU, I had already seen this. I knew that it was a danger. And if this happened to GNU, it would fail to achieve its goal of giving users freedom. So I designed a legal technique to stop that from happening. Copyleft is the name of that technique. And here's how it works. The license has conditions in it that allow you to redistribute exact copies and modified versions, but the conditions require you to respect the freedom of the next people. Just as you got it with freedom, you have to distribute it with freedom. That's what Copyleft says. So, for instance, copyleft says you must distribute with source code or make the source code available to the users. And you can't add unacceptable restrictions. And you also can't remove conditions from the license because if you did, then you could give it to your co-conspirator and he could then add unacceptable conditions. So, the copyleft license basically has to say when you redistribute it, you must keep the same license. So everybody has to keep the same license and everybody has to provide source code somehow or other to make sure that all users get the program with freedom. So by telling the middlemen that they are not allowed to make the program proprietary, we make sure that by the time you get it, it's still free. And you get the same freedom from them that they got from us. So there are two kinds, basically, of free software licenses. The ones with copyleft and the ones without. All free software licenses respect the user's freedom. Copyleft licenses go further and they actively defend the user's freedom. They defend freedom for all users. So, when Linux was republished under the GNU GPL, it became free software. And the combination of the incomplete GNU system with Linux, the kernel, was a complete free operating system, which was basically GNU, but also contained Linux. In other words, it's the GNU plus Linux system. 
However, the people who made this combination were so focused on Linux that they started calling the whole combination Linux, even though much more of it was GNU. And so they started calling the whole thing a Linux system, and this unfair practice spread. And that's how it is that millions of people use a variant of the GNU system, and they don't know it. They think that they're using Linux, and they think it was all started by Mr. Torvalds in 1991. Now, obviously, that's not fair to us, so please give us equal mention when you talk about the system. Please call it the GNU plus Linux system. We don't ask for more than equal mention, even though we did a lot more that of the work and started it. But it's true that credit is not the most important ethical issue in life. And if this were just about credit, it wouldn't be worth a big fuss. But there's something much more important at stake in your choice of what name to use for this system. And that is your freedom. Your freedom is at stake in this choice. Indirectly, of course. Because directly, a name doesn't change anything. You know, a rose would smell as sweet if you called it an onion. But on the other hand, if you offered onions for sale and delivered roses instead, cooks might be rather disappointed. So calling things by a misleading name can cause trouble. When you choose what name to use, you also choose what message you will communicate to others. And as it happens, the names Linux and GNU are associated with very different ideas. Since 26 years ago, the name GNU is associated with the ideas of the free software movement, ideas about freedom and social solidarity for the users of software. The name Linux is not, because the name Linux is associated with the ideas of Mr. Torvalds. And what are those? He rejects the ideas of the free software movement. He doesn't believe that users deserve freedom. He is concerned with practical values only. He wants powerful, convenient, reliable software. And he has a right to his views, but it's not right that our tremendous effort that we made for the sake of users' freedom be attributed erroneously to him and serve as his platform to argue against our ideas. The users should know where the system comes from, and they should know why it was developed, that we developed it so they can have freedom, because this will make them think about freedom something most of them have never done in connection with software. Our society doesn't encourage people even to raise the question of what freedom you deserve as a, in using a program. Now, thinking about this is vital because our future depends above all on what we value. Freedom is frequently threatened. It's threatened today in France and in the US and all around the world. To keep your freedom, you have to defend it. And you can see how true this is just by looking around. You know, it's not long ago that the president of the US decided to send agents to kidnap people and hand them off to countries where they would be tortured. And the current president of the US pretty much says he's going to keep doing it. Wasn't long ago that the president of the US told lies 
in order to launch a war of aggression in which about a million people were probably killed and he wouldn't allow the victims to be counted which is why I can only say probably. Freedom is frequently threatened and to, def to maintain freedom we have to defend it. But in most areas of life, ideas of human rights have been debated for centuries. So that's plenty of time to reach conclusions and spread them around the world. That doesn't mean we always succeed in defending human rights, but at least it gives a base of people prepared to try. But computing is a rather new area of life. Twenty years ago, not even in the most advanced computer con computing countries was computing used by a majority of the citizens. It was something that a few professionals and a few hobbyists did. And of course, in most of the world, it's even m newer. And in a lot of the world, most people still don't use computers. So that's not a lot of time to have a debate about the question, what are the human rights that you deserve in using a program? Even if we had tried to have that debate. But in fact, society has never, never raised the question because most people started using computers with proprietary software surrounded by other users of proprietary software. So they took for granted that software is proprietary. They assumed that proprietary software is legitimate which in effect means that they let the developers of proprietary software dictate the answer to that question. What human rights do you deserve in the use of a program? And their answer was essentially none. We can restrict you in any way we like. And most people just accepted this because it never occurred to them that they were entitled to reject it. So who is trying to start this debate? Who disagrees with the proprietary software developers? We in the free software movement disagree. But when we try to call their decision into question and say it's wrong, when we say that you deserve certain human rights, we think we've identified four human rights which you deserve in using a program, and these are the four freedoms that define free software. And when we say this, we have to overcome two big obstacles to make our ideas reach the users of our own operating system. One obstacle is they don't know it's our system. They think it's Linux, and they think it was all started by Mr. Torvalds, and they've heard what his ideas are and they just think they just follow those ideas and they think we're a bunch of radicals who never did anything and when we publish articles saying here's the philosophy on which the GNU project is based they see that and they say well that has nothing to do with me because this is the philosophy of GNU and I'm a Linux user now, what irony, if only they knew that the system they call Linux is really more GNU than Linux and we started it and this philosophy is why it exists. They still wouldn't have to agree with us, but they would probably pay more attention. We'd have a chance to convince them that they deserve freedom. And if they believe they deserve freedom, they'll join us in defending our freedom and our chances of winning and winning freedom for all of us will be greater. And we'll have a better chance of convincing them to join in defending freedom for you and them and me and all of us. 
But now there's another obstacle. And that is most of the users of free software don't even know the term free software because they've heard of it referred to by another term which has been carefully crafted never to raise ethical issues at all. And that term is, quote, open source, unquote. During the 1990s, there was a dispute within the free software community between two political camps. There was one camp of the people like me who valued freedom. We were doing this because we wanted to live in freedom. And then there was the other camp of the people who valued only engineers' values. Convenient, powerful, reliable software that you could get cheap. So we argued back and forth, and in 1998, the second camp adopted the term open source, figuring that since it was a new term, they could decide which ideas to associate it with, and they decided to omit completely anything that presented the issue as an ethical issue. So the open source people, they don't say that if a program is not open source, that means it's unethical. The most that they will say is, if you make it open source, probably it will get to be more powerful and reliable and efficient. So the issues which are the basis of what we do, they decided to omit. Well, even in 1998, there were already quite a number of companies involved with free software, somehow or other. But many of them also dealt with proprietary software. And they didn't want their potential future customers to come to demand freedom because then they wouldn't be potential customers for proprietary software. So they saw an advantage in saying open source because that wouldn't make their proprietary programs look, look wrong. And of course, the journalists and politicians mostly followed the businesses, which is why nowadays most of the users of free software don't know about the name free software or its ideas. They've only heard about open source. Is there any chance of obtaining more water? I'm surprised by how thirsty I've been ever since I got here. I think it's hot here. <clears throat> So we need to overcome these two obstacles simply by saying free software or logiciel libre or uh, software libre or whatever free as in freedom translates into in your language. You can help us because it will lead people to think about their freedom and not just how to get today's job done. If we don't think in the long term, those who are against us and are willing to think long term will always defeat us. <clears throat> and the danger of losing our freedom is not limited to all the rest of life. We can see it even in our field. Let me give you two examples. In 1992, when Linux was liberated, the combination of GNU and Linux was a complete free operating system that you could install in a PC and run it in freedom, although installing it was not very easy back then. But a few years later, People had made it considerably easier. There were several distributions of GNU plus Linux, each one conveniently packaged for installation of the programs you wanted to use. 
and these distributions were competing with each other and most of the community both the developers of these distributions and their possible users did not value their freedom so the developers of one distribution had an idea they could get an advantage over other distributions by putting in some proprietary programs and presenting them as a bonus with our distribution look what you get they said and it worked you their distribution became more popular so the developers of other distributions looked at that and said they're winning we had better uh, nullify their advantage by adding proprietary programs too and so over the years all the distributions put in proprietary programs ten years ago after my speeches when people asked me where can I get a copy of this system I had to respond I'm sorry I don't know any place I can recommend because all the distributions contain proprietary software and my conscience will not allow me to recommend proprietary software for any purpose ever so there's nothing I can answer you so we had arrived we had reached freedom and we had fallen back well I'm happy to say that today there are completely free distributions of GNU plus Linux there is for instance Ututo U-T-U-T-O and there is GNU Sense and there is uh, Dragora and Triskel and Venenux and a few others but these are not the well-known very popular distributions these are not the ones you've probably heard of the, the well-known distributions continue to contain to or suggest non-free software so we have begun to recover the freedom we had lost but just begun and now we have another problem in 1992 when Linux was released under the GNU GPL it became free software but now not all of it is free software in fact if you look at the source code of Linux you will find parts which are not free and are not source code in the middle of a dot C file you will find a list of numbers lots of numbers as many as 300,000 numbers and these numbers are actually an executable program whose source code is not released so that's not free software and many of them ca explicitly carry non-free licenses too so what happened Torvalds decided to make Linux free software but not because he thought there was an ethical reason it should be free he had other motives so he was doing things in a way that respected our freedom but not because that was but he didn't have that as his goal so our freedom depended on somebody who didn't actually care about it and he says so this is no, this is not my interpretation he will tell you this he has said this publicly so that means our freedom was precarious and years later for his, again for his own mo motives he thought the best thing to do for his motives was to include non-free software so if our freedom depends on somebody who isn't actually concerned with it it's in a risky situation today we have to maintain our own versions of Linux in which we erase the non-free parts for instance there is Linux Libre which is a free version of Linux so if we don't care about our freedom 
we're going to lose it over and over. And there's nothing more important for you to do than to think about freedom when you make a decision. Now, <clears throat> one of the common reasons for imposing malicious features is to uh, directly attack social solidarity. Today, many governments have said that their goal is to stop people from sharing. The war on sharing threatens to harm us all. This war is fundamentally evil because it's directed at the practice of helping your neighbor. It's directed at something good. Its goal is to stamp out treating other people well, to divide people. All of these nasty laws that they propose in so many countries are evil and not just because of the cruel measures that, they, that are used to achieve the goal, the goal itself is evil. The goal of stopping people from sharing shows the desire to subjugate and exploit people. So it's no wonder that they're willing to mistreat people gravely in the process. All of these laws need to be fought. And we need to fight against digital restrictions management, which we do with a campaign that you can find in the site defectivebydesign.org. If you visit the site, you can sign up and participate in our protests. We also have a site, windows7sins.org, which is designed to inform people that Windows 7 is just as nasty as Windows Vista, and uh, that Microsoft should not be able to escape from the odium of Windows Vista just by making some superficial changes and giving it a new version number. Now, some people who, disapprove, who are against free software try to spread fear by saying that if the w world switches to free software, then all the paid programmers would lose their jobs. This is FUD. In fact, nearly all paid programming work is development of custom software. It's not development of proprietary software products. That's a small fraction of the paid programming work. And the paid programming work, of course, is a small fraction of the IT sector work. Uh, and of course, people who can work in one sector can work, one part of the sector can work in another. But even if we look at the programming, most of that is not proprietary software development. So if the users learn to demand free software, we will lose a small fraction of a small fraction of the IT sector employment, which is not enough to even worry about. But that doesn't mean we will lose employment, because free software generates employment too. For instance, employment adapting and extending free programs. Now, users that want a solution, they can pay somebody to adapt and extend a free program. They can't pay you to adapt and extend a proprietary program because you can't get the source code, so there's no way you could do it. But with free software, you can do it. So we would lose a small amount of employment and we gain some employment. I don't know which one's bigger, so I won't try to predict whether the net change in employment would be positive or negative. But what's clear is even the worst possible case outcome is nothing to fear. There'll still be jobs for programmers, about as many as there are now. 
Another important issue is free software and public agencies, free software and the state. Government agencies must use exclusively free software because they have a duty to maintain control of their computing. If you and I lose control of our computing, that's a shame. But if a government agency loses control of its computing, that's dereliction. The government must maintain sovereign control over its computing because it doesn't do its computing for itself. It does the computing for the citizens and it has the responsibility to make sure that that computing is done as it should be. So the government must never allow a private software developer to take control of the government's computing. The government must never use proprietary software. And in some cases, it's even more dangerous because which is the country that's most likely to invade or destabilize other countries? It's the US. Which country are many big proprietary software developers located in? The US. Now, if a country's government agencies use proprietary software that was, that's developed and maintained by a, comp, a U.S. company. And if the U.S. government wants to attack that country, it just has to ask the company to sabotage their computers or put spy features in. It's a, to, to use proprietary software endangers national security. Another important question is free software and education. Schools must teach only free software. And this is not just a matter of possible savings of money. That's a superficial benefit. But consider why some proprietary software developers donate gratis copies of their non-free software to schools. They're trying to use the schools as an instrument to impose a dependence on all of society. They give the gratis copies to the school, the school teaches the students to use them, and the students develop a dependence on that software. And then they graduate. And after graduating, they're not offered gratis copies. And they go to work for companies those companies are not offered gratis copies. So the idea is that the school will direct the students on the path of dependence and they will pull the rest of society with them. Well, you might as well give those schools gratis needles full of addictive drugs saying inject them into the students to make them dependent. The first dose is gratis. Once you're dependent, then you have to pay. The school would not accept these gifts of addictive drugs and it should not accept these gifts of proprietary non-free software because the school has a mission in society and this mission is to educate the next generation as good citizens of a strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free society. And in the field of computing, this means teaching people to be free software users, accustomed to living in a free society, accustomed to using the technology which does not impose a dependence on society. But there's a deeper reason for the education of the best programmers. Many of us were fascinated by, by programming. At, if you're a natural born programmer, 
typically between 10 and 13, you are fascinated, you get fascinated, and you want to learn everything about how the computer does what it does. So if you use a program, you want to learn how it works. But when a youth asks the teacher, how does this program do this? If it's proprietary software, the teacher can only say, I'm sorry, it's a secret, you can't find out. So education is not allowed. Proprietary software is the enemy of the spirit of education. And schools should say it's not allowed. But if the program is free, the teacher can explain as much as he knows and then say, here's a copy of the source code of this program, because I figured people that you would ask, people like you would ask. Read it and you'll understand everything. And that kid will read it because he's fascinated and he yearns to understand. And the teacher can say, if you come across any point you can't figure out, show it to me, and together we'll figure out what that code does. And this gives uh, the youth a chance to learn something very important. That code is not clear, so you shouldn't write it that way. If even he can't figure it out, it must be very unclear. So if you want to write good, clear code, don't write it that way. Natural born programmers don't have to be taught how to program because it's obvious. But learning to program well is another thing. The way you learn to write good, clear code is by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. But you can only read it if it's free software. And how do you start writing lots of code? If you write small programs yourself, you don't get to see the challenges of big programs. But as a beginner, you don't know how to write a big program yourself and do it well. So how do you, how do you find that out? How do you learn how to write good code for big programs? How do you start small writing the code for big programs? You do that by writing small changes for existing big programs. And only free software lets you do that. This is how I learned to be a good programmer working at MIT. I worked in a free software community where we had a free software operating system. And my job was to make it better. So I had to read a part of a program and then write a change. And read a part of another program and write a change. And I did that over and over. And eventually I got to be good at it. Today, any school can offer that opportunity, but only if it's a free software school. But there's an even deeper reason for moral education, education in citizenship. Every school must teach not just facts and skills, but also, and most importantly, the spirit of goodwill, the spirit and habit of helping your neighbor. So every class should have this rule. Students, if you bring a program to class, you can't keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class. And you must bring the source code to class so that the other students can look at how the program works if they want to. Because the class is a place for sharing knowledge. However, the school has to follow its own rule in order to set a good example. So the teacher also must bring only free software to class and must share copies with the students and must also show them the source code. Schools have a responsibility to remove the proprietary software and teach their students free software only. So for more information, please see GNU.org for the GNU system and the free software movement, and also FSF.org, the site of the Free Software Foundation. At that site, you can, for instance, join the FSF. 
You could also join right here if you wish to pay cash. Uh, there's also a free software foundation in Europe, which is fsfe.org. And there is a free software foundation of Latin America at fsfla.org. And there's a free software foundation in India, which is at gnu.org.in. Most of our income in the Free Software Foundation comes from members' dues. So I'm a volunteer, but there is paid staff and they're supported by the dues you'll pay if you become a member. Now, to close, I would like to present my other identity and then have the auction. I am Saint Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. Emacs started out as a text editor, an extensible text editor, which became a way of life for many users because it had been extended so much they could do all their computing without ever exiting Emacs. And then <clears throat> it became a church with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs. Today in the Church of Emacs we have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs and we also have saints but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods we worship an editor. To become a member of the Church of Emacs you must recite the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. And then if you become a hacker, you can celebrate that by having a foobar mitzvah, which is a ceremony in which you stand in front of the community and chant lines of system source code. We also have the cult of the ex-virgin of Emacs. You see, the virgin of Emacs is anyone who has not yet learned to use Emacs. And according to the Church of Emacs, offering the virgin of Emacs a chance to uh, cure Emacs virginity is a blessed act. Now, the Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches I won't name. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. But it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control or set up for your use and install a wholly free operating system where holy can be spelled in more than one way and then only install and use free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and you live by it then you too will be a saint and you too will have the right to wear a halo if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. Now sometimes people ask me whether it's a sin in the Church of Emacs to use the other editor VI. It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast, but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. And sometimes people ask if my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo but it was a computer disk in a previous existence. So thank you.
So now it's time for the auction. I'm going to auction this adorable GNU, which needs a home, for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. And uh, if you have a penguin, then you need a GNU, because as we all know, a penguin just can't function at all without a GNU. So, uh, and, and what it, whatever is paid to buy this GNU will go to support our freedom. And also, I can sign it on the card if uh, that's of interest. So, I'd like to start with Oh, oh, by the way, when you bid, raise your hand and shout, because the point is you want me to notice you. So I'm going to start at 50 euros. Do I get 50 euros? I've got 50 euros. Do I get 55? I've got 55. Do I get 60? I've got 60. Do I get 65? I've got 65. Do I get 70? Do I get 75? I've got 75, do I get 80 euros? I've got 80, do I get 85? Do I get 85? I've got 85, do I get 90 euros? I've got 90, do I get 95? I've got 95, do I get 100 euros? I've got 100, do I get 110? Do I get 110? I can't hear you. By the way, we can accept credit card payment. Do I get 110? What? No, 110. Do I get 110 euros? 110. I've got 110. Do I get 120? Do I get 120? It, please don't speak if you're not bidding. I can't understand what you say, and it's confusing. So if you're not bidding, please don't speak now. Do I get 120? I've got 110. Do I get 120? Do I get 120? Uh, last chance to bid 120 euros to defend your freedom for this adorable GNU. Do I get 120? Uh, Est-ce que quelqu'un offre uh, 120 euros? J'ai 110 euros. Est-ce que quelqu'un offre 120? Dernière opportunité. One, two, three. Sold for 110. So now I want to answer questions, but I'm somewhat hard of hearing. Trying to well, some of you might be able to ask me questions by sp vocally by speaking slowly and loud like this with a microphone, and then I might hear the question. That's fine, but some people feel very quiet, like this, and I don't know what they're saying. I just can't hear it. So if you speak like that, it's totally useless. But I'm happy to take questions written. I can read better than I can speak. Sorry, I can read better than I can hear. And so that method is what I recommend. Uh, and you can write them in English or French or Spanish. Uh, and I'll still, I'll answer them in English. So how are we going to do this? If there's somebody who speaks loud and slowly and then there's a microphone or if you want to come close, then you want to try? I think I can speak loud enough. I mean, yeah, it's loud enough. Just pronounce all your consonants carefully so I can hear it. Sure. Uh, there's been some talk around the water cooler about the revenue source. And it's a curiosity. Sorry, do you mean when you say your revenue source? Are you talking about the FSF or me or what? Just, the question is put it, to put it simply is how do you, Richard Stallman, make money? What oh, well, I get paid for some of my speeches. That's your main revenue source? 
That's just about the only way I get any, I earn any income. We have uh, one situation in France which is related to some new ministries that deals with freedom, which is called the Ministry of Immigration and National Identity. This ministry has objectives to get people out of the country because somehow they didn't have a license to get into the country. This ministry is using free software to optimize operations to abduct people residing illegally in France. How do you see this? The issue of immigration is a difficult one because I don't believe that countries have no right to decide who can immigrate. On the other hand, sometimes they're cruel when they expel people. And meanwhile, we see disasters, and not all of them natural, happening in various places, and the people who are fleeing are not allowed to go anywhere. So that whether they should be deporting people is a, an issue I don't have an opinion about. But the real question you're asking is, what do I think if free software is used to do something evil? Well, suppose I made pens. What would I think if one of my pens, or even a thousand of them, were used to do something evil? What I would think is, pens are general purpose, and they're going to be used for everything, including evil. It would be utterly ridiculous to think of trying to stop evil by putting license restrictions on pens, restrictions from the manufacturer on how they can be used. And it's the same with free software. The software I developed, the software in the GNU system, is rather general. It could, Emacs, for instance, can be used to edit files and send mail about anything. So somebody could use it to edit a list of people to be kidnapped and handed over to uh, Egypt and Syria to be tortured. Well, that's evil. But it would be utterly absurd to try to prevent that by putting license restrictions in the use on a, pro a general program like Emacs. You can't push a giant with such a tiny lever. And not only that, but the only way we can enforce these licenses is through the courts set up by these governments. And if the governments decide to, to legislate exceptions for themselves, then their own courts will carry out those exceptions. So it's impossible to stamp out evil practices like this using license restrictions in software. But what we could achieve is to destroy the free software community. And the reason is lots of different people have different ideas about which government activities are wrong. And if free programs started to, if we were to tolerate restrictions on the use of a free program, what would happen is different programs would have different restrictions, and the result would be a system which you can't use for anything. So it's a useless and, and uh, idea, and trying to use it would only cause harm. A common suggestion is to forbid military use. Now, I don't want to do that because I'm not a pacifist. Uh, my father fought in a war not that far from here, 
and I am totally in favor of, of what he did. Now, there were no digital computers back then, but suppose there were, they would have been used. And I wouldn't have wanted to stop the U.S. Army from using computers to fight the Nazis. So, you know, there are, there are unjust wars and there are just wars. In many wars, there's a side that's evil and a side that's good. I'm quite happy that some countries uh, in Latin America are adopting free software in their armed forces. Minister 
saying, we purchased a company which is in Denmark and which employs two or 3,000 people. And if Denmark doesn't support software patents, we will move that business somewhere else. And the minister changed his position. So what advice would you give to this young, not so different young man who just wants to make a big buck? Uh, don't do it take, by attacking other people's freedom because that's wrong. And, and, and don't think only about how you're going to profit. Join movements that resist the power of big business because when they choose the laws, they design the game so that a few people, namely them, are going to win big and the rest of us are going to lose more than we need to. And you'll probably die as a result through global warming. So join movements. Don't just think about how you're going to make money. Think about how society is going to survive and be a good place to live in. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when Linux started uh, in 2001, uh, 1991. Uh, in, in, yeah, in 1991, so when Linux started. Right. So when it started, uh, why nobody from Guido just forked the project and kept it with the freedom and the open-minded ideas? Because, like nowadays, a lot well, of people... Let me, let, me let me answer you. Let me answer you. First of all, when Linux was first started, it was non-free software, so there was nothing we could do. But in 1992, Torvalds made it free software. So why didn't we fork it? Well, forking a program is not, A, is not very nice, and B, it's extra work, and why would we have wanted to? The best thing to do was to cooperate with him when there was an occasion and let him keep doing it. Even now, we haven't forked it. We release our modified versions, but they're not forks. So for instance, Linux Libre, 